song in the under days. Oh, who the Gula Shlema? Who is the Gula Shlema? Okay, Kindalach girls, here we go. Um, this is our second class of Ismail Sheikh Anukas. Last week I did a lot of talking. <laughs> what do we do every week? A lot of talking. <laughs> um, what did we talk about last week? We talked about where the capital is said and the context, right? This was our first class of Mid Mishachanukah. So I did the typical, we went through the ladder. Remember the different steps of davening? We talked about it. And uh, my own opinion about Pedis al Shema, to wrap Shema, that the Chachomim joined together several different mitzvahs the mitzvah of davening, the mitzvah of saying Shema the midst of praising Hashem, and they made them all into one continuum. And then later on, we added the fourth rung, and we discussed last week that Ms. Meshach Anukas, according to all the opinions that I saw, is before Baruch Sha'oman, before Baruch Sha'amari, you say Ms. Meshach Anukas. Why? So the simple answer is because it's a recent takono. The first people to incorporate Ms. Meshach Anukas into the Siddur are about 500 years, the Mukobolim, not earlier, and once you make a bracha, once you say baruch shoma, you don't want to make a hefsik. You don't want to interrupt. So again, all of the all the opinions that I saw, I'm not saying that this is absolutely true, that say mid meshech anukas and some don't, like for example, the Vilna God does not have mid meshech anukas advice in the siddur. Um, they say it before baruch shoma. Um, and then we started to read the pedic inside. That's what happened last week. We started to read the pedic inside. Ariella, do you have a copy of the Siddur from last week? Yes. Okay, so what we're doing right now is we're reading inside. We're actually going to read this, okay? Now, the way this capital goes, it has 11 lines. So I numbered the English based on where the Hebrew uh, lines are. I probably should have done it differently. I should have done it not by 11 lines, but by 15, I think it's 15 sukkim. Next time, I'll do it better. I, you know, by, by the time I figure out how to do this right, I'll be retired. Um, but you see what I did? The English have one A and one B. The, the beginning of each pasuk is marked on the English side and the correct line with a vertical line. So you want to look for the type of a particular, to the translation of a particular pasuk. It's relatively easy to find. You follow? You understand? So let's read. We're starting from the beginning. Mizmeir Shir. A song, a song. That's a type. Mizmeir Shir, be honest. Mizmeir means a song. Shir means a song. Chanukah Sabayis, of renewing the Beis HaMikdosh, Chinuch, of inaugurating, of, it's not building the house, it's Chinuch, right? The house is built, and after the house is built, you have to be a Chanuch Sabayis, right? Like when a baby goes to school, first the baby is born, then begins the Chinuch, and then the child grows up and becomes a self-standing person. Chinuch is, the house is already there, the bias is there, and you have to make a Chinuch, you have to inaugurate, you have to renew, you have to celebrate this bias. The David. David HaMelech is singing a song of Hanukkah Sabayas. So I told you last week that the word Mizmed and the word Shir both mean to sing. The difference is that Mizmed is Bekeli. Mizmed means with an instrument. And Shir means to sing with your mouth. And again, if you were here last week, you remember we spent some time on this that I explained to you that um, the difference between singing with a keli, with a tool, with an instrument, and singing with your mouth is tools are very helpful, right? If you play piano, you never get hoarse. The piano never loses its voice. The fiddle never loses its voice. A person can lose his voice. That's the advantage of a keli. But the nuance, the subtlety of the human voice can never be duplicated by even the best instrument and the best performer, the best player of an instrument, the human voice is unbelievably subtle. So that's the my love, Ms. Merenshe, you're singing with a keli, you're singing with, with your mouth. And of course, sometimes you have Ms. Meshir, and sometimes you have Shir Ms. right? Which comes first? The singing with the mouth or singing with the keli. And in Kabbalah, the difference between Ms. Meshir and Shir Ms. is from keli to oil or from oil to keli. When it says Shir, and then Ms. Meshir is oil and Ms. is keli. First light and then the vessel. When it says Mizme Shir, it's first Kali and then Er. First the vessel and then the light. Here it says Mizme Shir. First the vessel and then the light. David the Malach is singing a song. 
And the song that he's singing has to do with Chinuch, with Chanukah Sabayas. And he's singing it from the bottom up. First, he uses an instrument, a kli, and this gets him to shear that he can connect to singing with his own voice without an instrument. And he continues. Now, girls, I just did a lot of stuff, right? I reviewed all of last week's class in these five minutes. Do you remember? Huh? Any questions or comments? Don't be afraid of me. I only bark. I have never bitten anybody. <laughs> so far, I haven't bitten any of my students. So here we go. I will lift you up, God Almighty. Kidili Sonny. Dili Sonny is translated in English, for you have lifted me up. Right? The word Dili Sonny is from the Hebrew word Daloi, Dalad Lamed He, which means to when you go to a well. Yeah, you know what a well is? A be'e, you have water under the ground that's collected in a cistern, and you lower a bucket down into the well, you pull up water, that's called glia. Remember the story of Rivka? She went down to the well and she drew water. She used a dal, uh, a dli, dalad lamed yud, which is the cup that's dolly. So I remember Hashem, I will raise you up, Havaya, ki dili sunny, because you've drawn me out of a well. That's attached to what ki dili sunny. Going down into the well, vateda da aina vatamalakada vatal, right? Vayanka vavinu and Rachel. Remember, Rachel came with the sheep. Vagam dolei dolei lani by Tzipora and Moshe Rabbeinu, right? The word dolei lamed hey means to draw out of a well. So I remember Hashem, David the Malach singing, I will lift you up, Hashem. I will exalt you. The translation in English, kidili sunny, because you lifted me up out of the well. You slept me up from a low place. I just want to say. That the word Dalit Lamid, hey, Dalit Lamid, which means to pull me out of the well, also connotes being poor. A poor person is called an Oni. A poor person is called an Evian. And a poor person is called a Dal. Dalit Lamid means poor. Dilisani means you put me in a state of poverty and you pulled me out of it. You put me in a state of not having, and then you raise me out of that condition. Or to say it slightly differently, Kidili Sunny, that you humbled me. And in humbling me, you lifted me up. In other words, I'm giving you two translations of the word Dao. The simple meaning is you lifted me up. But the other translation is that you made me poor. And there's a connection that the Abish to lift David Hamelech out of the poverty or because of the poverty, the Abishta is able to lift him up. Because of David Amalek's brokenness, David Amalek's humility, the Abishta is able to lift him up. And you did not allow my enemies to be happy because of me. David Amalek has a lot of enemies. The whole Tillam revolves around David Amalek's enemies, which is really odd if you understand who David Amalek was. And you understand what the Tillam is, you find it strange that David Malchus constantly talking about his enemies. And of course, the enemies of David HaMelech were real people, but the enemies of David HaMelech are the Yetzirah, are the forces of evil in the world. And they're the Oyev, they're the enemy of Kedusha, they're the enemy of Eyid, they're the enemy of David HaMelech. And they rejoice, they're happy when David HaMelech fails. So David HaMelech says, you lifted me up, I will lift you up, because you lifted me up. And you did not allow my enemies to be happy, Lee, on my account. You did not allow that my enemies should be happy because of my failure. Right? There's two kinds of people in this world, Mushke. You know that? There are people who do and there are people who talk about them. <laughs> That's how it goes. There are people who do things and people sit around and talk about the people who are doing things. Oh, he's a good guy. He's a bad guy. He's a schnook. He's a, he's a schmendrick. He's a battling, right? And of course, the trick to life is to be a doer and not a talker. And Oiv Ali, David HaMelech's Oivim, his enemies sit around and talk about David HaMelech. And if David HaMelech fails, they're happy. If David HaMelech succeeds, they're sad. So David HaMelech says, Dili Sonny, you lifted me up and you did not allow my enemies to be happy about my fate, about my Maimed Amat. Hashem Elikot, God who is my God. Shivaiti Elecha, I cry to you. Shav'o is one of the many words that you know it's prayer. I cried out to you. Vatir po'eni, and you healed me. You healed me. What does the word you healed me mean? I was sick, and you made me better. So these are two different things. One is that Hashem lifts David HaMelech up, and the other is that he heals David HaMelech. Now, a little Hasidus for the morning. You know this, I'm sure, I hope. 
that in Hasidus, refuah is tshuva. In Hasidus, refuah, healing is tshuva, is return. So the meaning of the word tirpa'eni means you accepted my tshuva. You healed me because of whatever I've done wrong and you gave me a refuah. Okay? Hashem, God Almighty, come on. You pulled my soul out of the sha'il. Now, in English, the word sha'il means abyss. Abyss is spelled A B Y S S. You know what Rabbi Magel translates sha'il as? <laughs> he phoneticizes the Hebrew. It's S H E O L, sha'il. Hashem, God Almighty, Elisa, you lifted me up, min sha'il. So Rabbi Magel doesn't translate the word, he just calls it the sha'il, the abyss. Nafshi, my soul. He son, you gave me life, me yardi veil from to end up deep in the ground in a pit. To descend into a pit, into a hole in the ground. So the Malach is talking to the Abishta about the Abishta saving him from all kinds of situations, right? And by the way, a lot of them are far from translate. Halisa and El Nafshi, he son of Yardi Veid doesn't mean that David had fallen into the shoil. He could have fallen into the shoil, and the Abishta is not letting him fall into the shoil. Okay? Questions or comments? I just read the first three lines, which is four psukim. Questions or comments? Go ahead. Well, what is he saying, like, I will afflict you because you did this and that? Very good. Very, very good. Very good. That's a good question. Now, understand, we're going to come around to this again. And when we come around, we're going to explain it more comprehensively. Um, but the, the, the simple meaning is you, you're, it's a form of thanks. Hashem did good things for me, so I'm saying thank you. The expression that he uses, I will lift you up. Lifting you up means to put you on a banner, right? If, if you like somebody and that person is very, very important, you want everybody to know about them. So you write on a piece of paper or on a big sign, you know, Moshe is a nice guy and you hang it up on the street on Kingston Avenue. Everybody should see it. That's Halisa. You're lifting it up. But in Chassidus, it actually says the opposite. Aremimcha means I'm going to bring you down to be above me. I, by, we talked about this last week, that by Hashem, being high is actually being low. Hashem has nothing to do with us. And Hashem has to come down from where he is to be above us. You follow? Aremimcha means I'm going to make you higher than me. How am I going to make you higher than me? I'm actually going to bring you lower. Because Hashem by himself is higher than high. You understand? You're going to bring the Abish to down that it should be. That's how it says in Chassidus, that you should be above us. You wanted to say something? Yeah, I was trying to figure it out. Like, seriously. So, like, um, Hashem will make us like higher, but, and so he will bring. <laughs> we will bring him down, down. So he should be higher than us. But he already higher. I know, but he's so high that we have nothing to do with him. Ah, so, we're him down. so he could be our king, should be above us. Ah. Right. He's the, so high right now. So we'll like bring him like lower. That's right. Make him like above us. Above us. Okay. That's correct. Right. There's a lot of different expressions. The Gemara says, When you see the greatness of Hashem, he's being humble. He comes down to be great to us. And there's many other allusions to the same. So that's the chassidish title of the word, Aremimch. The simple meaning is, it's, I'm going to say thanks. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to say hello. I'm going to say hey, God to the Abish. I'm reading on. Yes? I'm on the fourth line. Zamru Hashem Hasidov. The Hasidim should sing to Hashem. Who are Hasidim? Hasidim are good guys. Hasidim are people who never did Naved in the first place. Zamru la vaye chasidim, that the Abishta's chasidim should sing to the Abishta. Vahoidu, and they should submit, they should accept, lezeicher kodeshe to his holy memory. So David Amalek is no longer talking about himself, right? In the first three lines, you're talking about himself. How the Abishta saved him, how the Abishta protected him. And again, the simple reading is that the Abishta pulled David out of a bad situation. But the deeper reading is the Abishta protected David from going into the bad situation in the first place. But now we're no longer talking about the Abishta, about David. Now we're talking about the Abishta. If you're a chassid, sing. What's a chassid? A chassid is someone who never did an Aveda. 
So certainly chassidim have to sing to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Zamra lavaya chassidov. The Eibush is chassidim. Those who are righteous in the relation with Eibush should sing. Vahaydu and they should submit lezeichel kodesh to the mention of His holiness. Key. Why should the chassidim sing and submit? Because by Hashem, there's a concept of anger, yeah? But it's for an instant. Rega, one second. And the truth is, all he wants is that we should live. Even when there's a rega bayape, there's a moment when Nebuchadnezzar is angry. Behind that, rega bayape is chayim biritzene. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar gets angry. When Nebuchadnezzar hides, the real reason for that hiding is to renew the chayim biritzene, that he wants us to live. Hashem wants us to live, and because Hashem wants us to live, if you're a chassid, you should certainly sing. Why a chassid never did naveda? His relationship with the is close. Even a baltuva should sing. Even the baltuva, but certainly the chassid should sing, because kirega bayape. There is a notion of Hashem's anger being for a moment, but chayim b'ditzayim. But he really wants his life. But at night you go to sleep crying, but la You wake up in the morning and you're singing. In other words, you have a moment of Rega Be'ab is angry, anger, but the real truth of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Chayim Be'ritzen, the Ibishter wants us to live, right? That's the old story. In this capital, an idea which we talked about in Haidu also is going to emerge very strongly. And the idea is, is the Ibishter a good God or a bad God? And by the way, there's only one God. It's not like there's two choices, yeah? Is the Ibishter good or bad? Or to say it in philosophy, they wish they're good, and sometimes things happen that are not good. Or they wish they're bad, and once in a while we see goodness. And there's a simple common sense answer to the question, a very common sense answer to the question. The common sense answer to the question is, if the Abish did is bad, he wouldn't have made us. Now I want to qualify. I want to qualify what that means. Saying Hashem is bad is stupid. It's stupid. Why? Because he's everything. What is bad? <laughs> what is bad? If there's a right way and a wrong way, and you choose the wrong way, that's bad. Hashem doesn't have ways. Everything is Him. Right? So how would you translate bad? Bad, you would translate is intolerant. Too demanding. Right? You have a teacher. You come to school, and you have students. You could be a good teacher or a bad teacher, or a kind teacher, not a kind teacher. A kind teacher, when his kids don't do well, forgives them. A strict teacher, when the kids don't do well, he criticizes them, he punishes them, he holds them accountable. So who's good and who's bad? If you, if you squeeze your students as much as they could be squeezed, but not more, you're good. If you don't squeeze your students as much as they could be squeezed because you want to be nice, you're bad. So there's a balance. The balance is you have to be demanding, you have to insist that the students should behave, the students should learn, the students should listen. But you also have to understand that the students are not going to be perfect. If you expect the students to be perfect, you can end up with no students. You understand? So there's Abish, there's Midas Achesed, Hashem's kindness. And then there's Midas Ames, Hashem's truth. What's the truth? He wants us to be perfect. What's Hashem's kindness? We're not perfect. And he accepts us. You know why he accepts us? Because he wants us. So when the Ebishter made the world, that's an expression of chesed, not emes. The truth says people are never going to be good enough. Don't bother. Kindness says people are not going to be good enough. But make them anyway. Because you want them. That's chayim The Ebishter's real rotsness chayim that we should live. Even though there's a rega b'yape, every once in a while, Hashem puts on a mask, and we don't see him. And because we don't see him, we experience gavuro, we experience, we call it punishment. We experience exactitude, the Ebishter is gavuro. The Ebishter gives us his gavuro occasionally. The Ebishter gives his gavuro momentarily to get more out of us, to make us better. But he's not trying to destroy us. He's not a vengeant God. He's not trying to punish us. Because Beret Sinai, what does he really want? He wants chayim. He wants us to live. He doesn't want us to die. He wants us to die with the made us in the first place. And therefore, even though at night you cry, you go to sleep with tears, but you wake up in the morning and you sing because the Abish really wants life. 
So the, this, this is line four and five, right? That if you're a chassid, you should certainly praise the HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because the truth of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Chayim B'Ritzim, the Mishnah wants life. Now comes the next passage. I'm on line five. I must tell you that I believe that this line five, this is the key to this painting. I want you to understand how this works. I sit in yeshiva, I sit in my home, and I research. I spent a lot of time learning this Mizmah Sheikh and Achis. I'm not finished. I don't know yet how I'm going to teach it to you. I don't know yet. I've collected so many different Mavarshim. You can see my notes. I collected a lot of different Mavarshim, and I wrote summaries of them, and I organized them. I'm still not sure how I'm going to teach it when I go this again. But I think at the moment, I think this posseg, I think this posseg is the key to this painting. I was thinking, Bishalvi, that means in my shalom, in my peace, in my serenity, I'm never going to move. This posseg, has many different types. But the constant is life is good and I want it to stay the same. And the Amarti, I was thinking, Bishalvi, it's peaceful, Balev, nothing should change. Why? It could be because I'm a tzaddik. But I don't want to be more of a tzaddik. Just who I am is perfect. And the Amarti, Bishalvi, I'm a tzaddik. I have a serene life. I have a peaceful life. Nothing should change. It could also be in a Marasha. And the Shoyim, they want to have a peaceful life. They want to live their life. They have no relationship with the Abishta. Nothing should ever change. But it doesn't work out that way. I was thinking when I found myself in a position of serenity, nothing should change, but it's just not the way it goes. It's not the way it goes for many reasons. And ultimately the reason is because the person was created for work, not for rest. Hashem, the Abishtay, God Almighty, with your will, you stood me up. Laharari means to be like a mountain. And oiz means strong. The Abish that made us like a mountain that is strong. Okay. However, his start of when you turned your face away, he said, Nival can immediately bewildered. In other words, the postic before, line five, Aniamati Bishalvi. I was thinking Bishalvi in my peace and my Why? Because the Abish that gave me that feeling, Hashem gave me a permanence. But the next word say is the Abish hides. And as soon as Hashem hides, I easily become very, very bewildered, become very afraid. So what's the game? What's the cat and mouse? The game is Abish put us on this earth. And what did I say before? Hashem wants us to live. Hashem wants us to live. Hashem wants us to live means he didn't make us to destroy us. He didn't make us to punish us. He didn't make us to have expectations of us that we cannot deliver, which is going to result in our own destruction. He wants us to live, but he also wants us to work. And the argument of Hashem is wrong. Let everything stay the same if not the Kaban of the Abishta. And therefore, self Hashem hides. When Hashem hides, we become very, very confused. Let me talk about this for a moment, okay? Let me talk about this for a moment. Huh? Say that again. Did I say Hashem is ashamed? No, I'm saying maybe. Oh, that's why he's hiding his face. Yeah. Okay, I want you to know. He's ashamed of what he in, under the right conditions, you can say almost anything. In other words, what you say depends on how you say it and where you say it. It's not good for Hashem to hide his face. You know why? Because when he hides his face, we suffer. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about this, okay? Um, again, I want to remind everybody, I'm reading this Patek and I'm translating this Patek. After I finish reading this page and translate page, there's going to be more discussions, and then I'm going to read it again. When I'm going to read it the second time, that's when we're going to be learning it with with Chassidus, with Pneumius, you understand? That's how I do each paragraph. We introduce it, we learn it, we talk about it, and then we relearn it, okay? So uh, everything I'm doing now is preliminary. This is just an introduction, okay? But nevertheless, I want to talk about the Ishtar hiding his face, right? I want to give you an idea, which, which I believe... It's true. Obviously, if I didn't believe it's true, I wouldn't teach it. 
but I don't know if it's true because it's sort of an idea which I've developed and I can't remember where I saw it, okay? When you look at another person's face, what do you see? Okay, I'm gonna, give you, I'm gonna give you an uncomfortable example, okay? I don't know you, I don't know what you're holding, but one day you're gonna date a boy and the boy is gonna date you. You know, you've already gone on dates. Yeah, and you're gonna look at him, what are you gonna see? You're gonna see his eyes, you're gonna see his countenance, you're gonna see how well dressed he is, how much he prepared himself to go out on the date, yeah, how much he thought about you before he showed up. Well, what are you gonna see? That is gonna open up his mouth and stuff's gonna come out, right? And then you're gonna to have to figure out how to align what you saw when you looked at his face with the words that come out of his mouth. Now, it would be nice if you spent enough time with him to get to know him so well to decide if the only way to get to know a person, whether you should marry them or not, <laughs> is marry them first. That's a bit of a problem. Isaiah Gaitas, right? You understand that. Um, but when you look at a person, there's two answers to this question. Number one, you look at a person's face, you see an awful lot. You can know a lot about a person by looking at them. But it's also true when you look at a person's face, you don't know anything. The face of a person is a mask. It's a mask. If you have a hush, if you have a sensitivity, like you said, you can look into the eyes and maybe you could look at that face and see something about that person. But often the face is a mask. So this is my insight. My insight is that there's two ways to look at the very same face. One way you look at the face and the face reveals everything. That's called Chochmas Adam Toyin Panav. The light of a person's face reveals what that person is. And the other way to look at the face, you look at the face and you don't see anything. And that's called Hester Panav. Hashem hides by showing you his face. Where a few lines before, Kirega Biyapa, you look at Hashem's nose. What do you see when you look at Hashem's nose? Af is translated contextually as anger. But Af literally means the person's chaitim, the person's nose. For a second, Hashem shows you his face. Is that good or bad? When you see the face of God, you see nothing. You know why? Because the face of God is so powerful. The face of God is so much that to you it's a mask. Alternatively, the face of God is revealing everything. You understand? So the meaning of the word nose and the meaning of the word face means Hashem is a hiding. You know how he's hiding? By showing you too much. When he shows you too much, it's a mask. And when you look at too much and you see nothing because you're blinded by not able to see it, you see never, you get confused, you get afraid. You're looking straight at Hashem and you're experiencing his tatapanech. You're experiencing Hashem hiding his face. In other words, Mushka, to speak to you, Hashem doesn't hide his face by putting his hands over his face. Hashem hides his face by showing it to us. But when we see the face of God, we don't know what we're seeing. We can't see anything. You follow? And the person becomes confused. I have this relationship with the Eivishter. And Hashem shows me everything. When he shows me his face, I see nothing. So, I was thinking just the way it is, is the way it should stay. My life is peaceful. Nothing should change. Hashem makes me into a mountain of strength. In other words, again, the same idea that everything should remain the same, and then Hashem hides. Hashem doesn't hide by hiding. Hashem hides by showing us his face. When we look at the face of God, we don't see anything. And therefore, Yishe Nibble become confused. And we follow it up with the following verse. And we call out to HaKadosh Baruch. And David HaMalach is speaking. I call to you, God. The El Hashem is Hanon. The word Hanino means I, I plead, I beg. It says in English, supplications to the Lord. I'm not sure exactly what supplications means. But Hanin is the form of prayer. Like, and Chazal say there's many translations. But one of them is, I'm calling to Hashem and asking him for a matnas chinam, for a gift that I, that I don't deserve, for free. Elacha Hashem, to you I call. Be'el havaya es chanon, and then I plead with Hashem. And I negotiate. Listen to this pasuk. The next pasuk is so... Wonderful. This is an argument that you're having with HaKadosh Baruch. You're having an argument with HaKadosh Baruch. And this argument is a rhetoric. You know what that means, a rhetoric? The argument repeats itself and repeats itself and repeats itself and repeats itself. 
And it's really the other side of what we said before. Remember we said before, Chayim Beretayne. What does Chayim Beretayne mean? On the last word on line four, the first word on line five. Hashem wants us to live. Hashem doesn't want us to die. So now we're telling the Abish they're back. Chayim Beretayne. Ma betza bedami. What ma betza? What reward is there in my blood? So now you translate this in English. If a person dies, ma betza. What is the Abish again again? If a person dies. When a person goes down to a place of shachas, that means destruction, nothingness. Will the sand praise you? Will the sand submit to you? Will the earth speak your truth? You want to punish me? Yeah, I'm no good. Okay, so you're going to punish me. You're going to put me in the ground. Yeah, is the ground going to die? <laughs> you understand? This is a negotiation. Before we said Chayim Beretzeina, the Abishta wants us to live. Now we're arguing Chayim Beretzeina. We're saying the proof or the logic to the idea that Hashem wants us to live rather than wants us to die because the Abishta gains nothing from us dying. Ma'abetza b'dami. What kind of schai, what kind of reward is the Abishta going to have a dummy if he takes my blood? When they fall down into the grave, will the dust praise and submit to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Is the earth going to speak my truth? And therefore, Shema Havaya Vachanini, listen to me, God Almighty, and give me Chanino, give me a Matnas Chinam, give me a gift that I may not deserve. Adeshem de Ebishter, Haye Ezer Li, be for me, help, help me. Why should the Ebishter help me? Why should the Ebishter give me Chanino? Why? Because the Ebishter created me. And if he created me, he wants me. And if he wants me, he's got to take me the way I am. Now he has to push me. He has to get me to become a better me. But at the same time, Chayim B'Ded Tzayin, Hashem wants us to live. At the same time, Ma'abet Z'abedome, B'Ded Tzayin Shachas, Ha'yedich Of, Ha'yagin Abdecha, De'evish, that gains nothing by punishing us. Why? So he punished, put us in the ground. Is the ground going to praise him? No. A, a person has to praise him. A Yid has to praise him. So this is how we answer the Eivish. Okay? So now, the way you look at this Pedic is, um, I'm going to keep reading, okay? I'll finish. I'm on line nine. Hafachta mispidi. You transformed what would have been my husband, my eulogy, my, my, my punishment. Lamochali. Lamochal means to a dance. You know what mochal means? To dance the horror. That's lamochal. To dance in a circle. Lamochal, lamochal, right? Who danced? Who in Chomish danced in a circle? You remember? Miriam. Tupim means that the musical instruments. They danced in, they danced the horror, they danced in a circle. And there's a discussion in Hasidis about what it means to dance in a circle. But what else does the word machal mean? Mechila, to forgive. You see how words in Hebrew are so complex, right? You transform what would have been my husband, my eulogy, my end. Lemocheli into a dance or into a forgiveness. Pitachta sake, you untied, you opened up the sack where I'm held prisoner. Vata azereni, girls, who speaks Hebrew? Vata azereni with an aleph. You davened this morning. Yeah, you said brachot. Yeah, there's two brachas. One is about a gatl and one is about a hat. Right? The one that's about a hat says, Oiter Yisrael Bitifara. And the one that's about a godless oizer, Yisrael Begavur, how do you spell oizer? Alevov Zayin Resh. Look at the Vatazreni. Oizer means you girdled me. You tied me with a gatl of simcha. You see? Pitach saki. You opened up my sack. You opened up the place where I was trapped. Vatazreni. And you girdled me with simcha, with joy. You ready? Why? Leman. So that. Yizamen Chachavet. That Chavit, whoever Chavit is, some people say Chavit is COVID. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. Yizamercha should praise Akadish Baruch Hu. Velo Yidaim should never be quiet. Velo Yidaim never be silent. Hashem Alekai, the Abishtin is my God. La Elo Medaka, I will praise you. I will submit to you forever. Okay, now, girls, how long did that take? 
It took about 35 minutes. Really, it took about 35 minutes trying to this capital. You understand the capital? You understand it? This capital is a seesaw. Woo! Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What's the capital saying? What's the what's the neshama of this pedic? What's the neshama of this pedic? Again, I think that the neshama of this pedic is line five. Ani amati b'shalvi balem et leyelam. The David Hamelach says, "I thought life is wonderful; it should never change." Okay, but if you had to divide this capital into sections, here's how we would do it. The first three lines is David Hamelach talking about himself. Then you have line four and the beginning of line five is talking about tzaddikim, chasidim. Line five and line six are talking about things never changing. N things never changing is not good for chasidim, it's not good for tzaddikim, it's certainly not good for benyanim about the tshuva. Okay? So then the end of line seven, the end of line six, right? It's start of anecha. Um, uh, so the end of line six, seven, eight, and nine are describing the struggle that the person has when he realizes that things staying the same is not good. Things staying in one place is not good. And then the last two kapitlach is basically a thank you. In other words, line nine, the second half of nine, and 10 and 11 is a thank you to HaKadosh Baruch. So you can divide the Pedic up into one, two, three, four, five parts. It's 15. So it comes up into five parts. In the beginning, David HaMalach is talking about himself, about his own experience, his own life. And then David HaMalach speaks philosophy. Some people are Bali Chuba, and some people are Tzadikim. And for neither of them is the idea of everything staying the same good. Okay, and in the end, we praise Akadosh Baruch Hu for for turning our life around and making it go in a good direction. This is how I understand this capital. Now, is it correct what I just told you? I don't know. I really don't know. Is it incorrect? I don't know that either. Okay, but this is where I'm holding right now. In other words, I'm going to keep learning. I'm going to keep preparing. Each week, I'm going to come back. We're going to do a little bit more. And each time we do it, I'm going to know a little bit more and I'm going to tell you a different meaning. But at the moment, that's how we understand this capital. This capital is personal to David HaMelech, but it's also David HaMelech's musing. He's fabrenging. The first three lines are David HaMelech describing what's happening to him. And the next seven lines or eight lines are David HaMelech philosophizing about what happened to him. Right? There's all kinds of people. One of the things we need to know about life that the idea that you feel like the way life is is the way life is going to stay is not correct. Not it's not correct because Hashem is mean, Hashem is bad because you have to grow. And therefore, whether you're in the Madrig of a or you're in the Madrig of a Tzadik, there is a concept of Hashem hides or Hashem shows us his face. When Hashem sees, shows us his face, we see the mask. We're not able to see the light of the face. We see the mask, we get all confused. Why? Because Abish wants us to grow. And we finish the Pedic by saying thank you. Okay, so the Gemara is davening. We did Hoidu, now we're doing Midrash with that. We're doing Siddur. Siddur, but it's oh, okay. before Bar Shamar. This is before Bar Shamar. Yeah. You say it every day, lady. You have a regular Siddur or a Shmansi Siddur? This is one. Are it's Psalm 30. Dominant? Pardon me? Are women in Pasir from Dominant? Because it's Midrash with Mangrama. Phil is not Mangrama. Krishna is Mangrama. Phil is not Mangrama. The feel is once a day you got to pray according to the Rambam. For women. For everybody. General. Everybody. Nusach HaTfilah and Zmanei HaTfilah are the Rabbanon. What you say and when you say it is Medei Rabbanon. Medei Rai say you have to daven once a day and there's no difference in men and women because Tfilah is not Zman Gnomo. Right, but how you daven is in Halacha, is it? The particular davening or not. 
But the tradition is, the tradition is that a single girl or someone without little kids who's a woman should try to do b'shach ha'semimcha. At least the basic prayers. You know this, you went to be significant. <laughs> okay. I, I, I wrote a meditation prayer. I can't hear. I learned a new concept of prayer. A meaningful kind. Asking, yeah. A personal concept of prayer. So you should know that the chi of is once a day to connect HaKadosh Baruch. And ask him for what you need. Don't just say hello. Don't say I'm ashamed. Don't say you should be ashamed. Ask him. I, I, I wouldn't mind if you did. I really wouldn't mind if you did. But ask him. Ask him. Somebody told me a story recently. Ah, Chavei Shvat. Chavei Shvat was a week ago. So Shmuel spoke of this marathon video that they had. And he told a story how he spent the whole day in 770. So Zalman Jaffe, his father-in-law, said to the Rebbe's in Chaya Mushka that Shmuel spent the whole day in 770. He didn't have a chance to eat. So she said, Haskidat Onklap Mentir. The Rebbe's was living next door. The Rebbe's lived in the library. Shabbos and Yamtav, the Rebbe's was next door to 770 library. So the Rebbe said to him, you should have knocked on the door and I would have let you and give me a coffee and cake. So he said, the Rebbe, the Rebbe was saying to him, if you'll knock on the door, we'll let you in, but you got to knock on the door. So my wife repeated this to me. I didn't watch the film that the Rebbe Lou said, not clapping in the ear. I said, well, we're all afraid to knock on the door because we don't feel worthy to knock on the door. But the Rebbe said that you'll knock on the door. As to Uncle Apmentir, if you knock on the door, they'll let you in. The Rebbe will let you in. The Rebbe's neighbors will let you in. Anyway, any other questions or comments? We're going to stop now. It's 11.30. Let's see if we can do this in five. It's 11.37. I have notes. I have a record of a bunch of different so explanations for this capital. And more importantly, why we say this, okay? Let's take a five minute break. <laughs> Let's try to make it as close to five minutes as possible and then we'll reconvene, okay? Okay, good. Sure. Mushkele, nem.